In this video, I'm gonna share with you what I think are some of the biggest mistakes people are making while using limiters. The first one has to do with oversampling. Because oversampling takes extra CPU and can introduce latency, you might be tempted to leave it off while you're working, dial in all your settings, and then just check it to go on for your final high quality render. Big mistake, let me explain why. So I've got a drum and bass mix spooled up. I'm gonna crush it really hard into a limiter. Here's what we're working with. Okay, so maybe you've heard that you need to use oversampling to reduce distortion or aliasing and to get a higher quality render. I want to show you what the impact of activating oversampling at this stage has. So I never would normally do this, but I'm going to use a second limiter so I can separate out what's happening in the oversampling process so you can see it in the second gain trace. Okay, we're going to leave gain at zero, and I'm just going to turn oversampling to 8x. Watch what happens. Okay, we're getting one to over one dB of extra limiting because the oversampling is now picking up a higher amplitude signal through the oversampling process, right? It's detecting intersample peaks. Why is this important? It's because that is causing the limiter to now introduce more limiting. What does more limiting do? Like if you're on the edge, like with loud genres like this, and you've already dialed it in kind of where you can get it and still sound clean, more limiting is going to dull your transients. It's going to actually introduce more distortion. Wait a second. Why are we using oversampling? We're, we're using oversampling to get a higher quality render. Wait a second. This seems totally at counter purposes. And it's because you've followed the process wrong. If you work and you dial in all of your settings, and then all of a sudden you tick on oversampling and you introduce more limiting, bad idea. You can ruin, you can ruin a master like this. One dB is a lot. So what you have to do is either work with oversampling on in the first place the whole time, or once you enable oversampling and you figure out how much extra limiting is happening, you back off the gain into your limiter to compensate for that. So you're actually getting the same amount of net limiting, okay? Now, the other thing is, what, what about true peak limiting? Okay, so let's turn this regular oversampling off, and we're going to turn true peak limiting or TPL on. Now watch what happens. We're getting the exact same amount of increased limiting by engaging TPL. Now, some of you who really understand this, other mastering engineers are going to know this is why a lot of people don't like the sound of true peak limiting because it does it's oversampling in FabFilter Pro L2. It's actually a secondary limiter stage after the main limiter that uses 8x oversampling. ITU specifies 4, 4x oversampling, and that's what some companies use. FabFilter uses 8. So it's causing all of this extra limiting that you have to understand what the impact of that is and compensate for it. Okay? So, um, yeah, don't just go ahead and work with oversampling off. Tick it on at your end of your process without adjusting any settings. It changes the sound of your master quite substantially in some cases. Mistake number two is using a mastering limiter like Pro L2 in a place where you should be using a clipper or something lightweight like a track limiter. When you're mixing loud and you're trying to get clean results, it's definitely a best practice to be able to do gain reduction at a track by track individual sound level. That's awesome, or on your buses and on your buses. However, using a big brain resource intensive mastering limiter like Pro L2 is the wrong move. Let me show you why. So a lot of people have seen this trick in Pro L2 where you take look ahead to zero, you take attack all the way up, and release all the way zero. And this actually turns it into a hard clipper, okay? Hard clippers are awesome. I love them. I use them all the time. But you've now just created the most inefficient CPU wasteful hard clipper in the entire world, okay? Let me show you actually what is going to happen by duplicating this track out a whole bunch of times. I'm gonna make a whole bunch of copies so there's 10 extra copies, there's 20, there's 30, there's 40 extra copies. And then we're actually going to play this with audio muted. Okay, so we're getting 15% uh, CPU usage. Now let's compare that to 
something that I would actually use on a track by track basis, which is an actual lightweight clipper. This is Orange Clip by Schwab Digital. Exactly the same amount of clipping. Okay, so now let's take that and compare CPU usage. Two percent, two percent. Super wasteful and uh, really ridiculous to use a mastering limiter for duties like that. But what if you need a limiter and not a clipper? Okay. Well, um, there is a really amazing lightweight track clipper made by DMG, and it's basically limitless except it is not multiband and it's super lightweight. So this is going to do the exact same job. It works just as well, if not better than Pro L2 in many cases for working on individual tracks, and it's incredibly lightweight, okay? So let's go ahead and take DMG track limit. We'll do the same test. We'll duplicate it 10 times, 20 times, 30 times, 40 duplicates. Look at the CPU. Okay, it was running about 7%, so it's half as much as using Pro L2. Uh, but it is a lot more than using the hard clipper. So use the hard clipper or soft clipper if you can. If you need a limiter to be more gentle, then go ahead and use a track limiter, but don't use a mastering grade CPU heavy limiter all throughout your project like this. The third and final mistake that I'll point out is leaving True Peak limiting engaged by default at the beginning of your process. And I believe that FabFilter Pro L2 loads like that when you install it. TPL is on by default. I've changed this. I've overwritten that behavior, made my own preset and saved it as default to override that. And if you go through and you flick through a lot of their presets, you'll see True Peak limiting coming on. Now that's great if this limiter is for mastering and it's last in chain and you want True Peak limiting because you're rendering for a platform that requires that or you just like that sound. I don't. And there are many cases where you might be using this limiter on a bus or something where it's not last in chain on your master. And to me, that makes no sense in having True Peak limiting engaged if you're using it inside the project and not on your master. It's just engaging two limiters unnecessarily. Now, the other aspect of it, and the reason even on my master, if I'm using True Peak limiting, I don't engage True Peak limiting in my, final, in my main limiter. What I do is I follow the advice of a colleague of mine, Ian Stewart, He's one of the mastering engineers behind the Mastering Engineers Worldwide group on Facebook. He is a technical writer for Isotope, and he also runs Flowtown Mastering. And what he was sharing with me he does is he actually uses a second limiter and uh, behind his main limiter, and he engages True Peak Limiting in that second limiter so he can specifically monitor what it's doing, the impact it has on the sound. And then once he figures out what that's doing, he can make adjustments, I would expect, by backing off the amount of gain on the first limiter to compensate for added limiting that the second TPL limiting stage is doing. So again, I just don't leave this on by default. I would, uh, if it was me, I would monitor and use a second stage for that reason. And definitely if you're using this limiter inside your project, then it doesn't make any sense to me to have uh, True Peak limiting engaged. Right on. So that's a wrap on these three mistakes. This video is actually part of a playlist that I'm doing on limiting best practices, using limiters, getting to know limiters better, and some of my favorite limiters. So check the link in the description of the video and the pinned comment, and I will post the playlist there as I add more videos to it. I'd also like to ask you for your support if you're in a financial position to be able to help out with funding me to create more videos. I've started a Patreon-like tier. The link is in the description of the video. And I'm starting to make this my full-time focus. I'm really putting uh, the vast majority of my effort into creating free uh, deep dive videos for you guys here on YouTube, similar videos to ones that I would just have charged money for in the past. And if you're uh, in the financial position to be able to chip in a few bucks on a monthly basis to help me with that goal, I would super appreciate it. There's also a super thanks button down below where you can give me a one-time couple bucks uh, in the YouTube platform. Greatly appreciated. As always, uh, give the video a thumbs up if you liked it. Drop me some comments, let me know what you thought. Subscribe to the channel if you're not already. Happy music making, and I will catch you on the next video. Much love.